Good morning, everybody. Today is Tuesday, April 27th. It's the last week of April, which is amazingly um, difficult to believe. And we've got three more weeks before the end of tax season. <laughs> the new updated and improved tax season. I'm Marina Parkin. I'm with Coons and Parkin CPAs. Today, I am joined with um, John Seifer, who is our business coach extraordinaire. John has been working with us for the past three years, if not more, and has really helped us take our business to um, a whole new level. And today, uh, John is going to talk to us about um, whether we should continue to grow our business and maybe not, <laughs> and maybe in a different way. So John always has um, a lot of uh, great comments and um, snide remarks at us. So hopefully... <laughs> The information is going to be useful to a lot of our business clients. And uh, please send me the questions in the chat and then I will um, keep monitoring or just po uh, post them in Q&A. And then we'll ask John some questions. And as always, this is going to be recorded and shared on our um, website, kunsandparkin.com and kunsandassociates.com. And um, if you want uh, to get in touch with John, he's going to have his contact information at the end. And also, please uh, shoot me an email, and then I will share his contact information with you. So, John, without further ado, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much. Let me get my screen share up here. Get that out of there. So, <laughs> I was me. shocked. <laughs> Pardon? It's me, 48%. Yeah, right. Stop, I, I was actually stop. shocked to hear this was the results of a, um, of a survey by the Hartford Insurance Company that 48% of their small business clients didn't want their companies to grow. And I was shocked when I heard that. But then I realized um, over time, I realized I was just being naive. So uh, my name's John Seifer. I've been a business owner for my entire working life. I've literally never had a job. I do want to say thanks to Joanne and Marina for the chance to present today. And as I've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs in the U.S. and in Europe, I found many want to run much larger companies. But for some people, growing their company conflicts with some of their other life goals. Others want to grow but don't know how to grow a company without putting their family life or their well-being or, or even their health at risk. So uh, even though I've been working with entrepreneurs since 1994, I got some ideas from a book that I'll tell you about in a minute, and it opened my eyes to a key insight about how to decide what size your company should be. So let's get started. In order to survive, your company only has to do three things. The first thing, obviously, is make something that people want to buy. Then you have to find those people and sell to them. And then you have to support the making and the selling. Support means paying the bills, collecting money, providing facilities and tools, hiring, managing, planning legal infrastructure, all that kind of stuff, so that the makers and the sellers can do their jobs most effectively. These are the three things a company needs to do to survive, but there's a fourth thing that it needs for in order to thrive, and that is a vision of where you want the company to go. And this all happens with you as the owner or CEO at the center, like the conductor of an orchestra. It's interesting that the conductor doesn't play any of the instruments, but in a smaller company, sometimes you're playing all of the instruments or maybe even most of them, but that's another webinar for a different day. Today, I wanna to get into the vision part. This is the topic where, uh, this is the part where our topic fits in. Mm -hmm. And those four things that I mentioned, they get expanded into multiple tasks and tools. And as you grow multiple people performing multiple functions to bring each of those things to pass. Here's how the vision part expands. These are the different tasks and CEO tools that it takes to execute your vision for your company. Today, we're going to look briefly at two of them, briefly at one and in depth at another. We're going to look at your personal vision, which is what you want from your company. And then we're going to look at the stages checklist. What happens to your company at different stages of growth so that you can figure out if what you want is going to happen by growing or by shrinking or by staying the same. This is the one that's surprising to most people because as companies grow, they're not just bigger, they're different. That reminds me of, of a guy I went to college with who was a commercial baker for a while. And he told me that if you have a recipe at home for a couple dozen cookies, and you wanna double it, you just multiply all the numbers by two and everything's fine. But if you're scaling it up 
uh, on commercial scale to like 60 or 70 dozen cookies, you actually have to change the proportions because at that size, things are different. And that's how it works for companies too. There's actually three different distinct stages of a company as it grows. And I don't know if you remember your Greek mythology. Um, I didn't either. I had to look this one up. But there was a guy named Oedipus, and he came a across a town called Thebes, which was guarded by the Sphinx. And the Sphinx asked a riddle of everyone who wanted to enter the city. And if you could answer the riddle, she would let you go in. But if not, she would eat you. So nobody had ever answered the riddle. So I don't know. She must have had a lot of good meals. Um, of course, Oedipus answered the riddle, or this wouldn't be much of a myth. And he went into the city of Thebes, and the people chose him as their king. Here's the Sphinx's riddle. What goes on four feet in the morning, two feet at noon, and three feet in the evening? Four feet in the morning, two at noon, and three in the evening. And the answer is a person. When we're babies, we crawl on all fours. When we're adults, we stand on two feet. And when we get old, we need a third, a staff or a cane to help us get around. So uh, that was what got uh, Oedipus to be king of Thebes. But similar to these three stages, a company has three stages. And I first learned about this in a book called Exit Planning by John Brown. He came up with these three stages. His goal, and his whole book is about how to sell your company. And his goal of these three stages was to show you that there's more wealth in the later stages of a company. A stage one company doesn't sell for much at all. But what's interesting was he named them from the perspective of the business owner or what the CEO is doing. So he calls the first one, these are his names, hands on, head down, hands off, head up, and hands off, head, I mean, head, heads off, hands off, head down is the second one, hands off, head up is the third. And I took that approach and embellished it from the perspective of you, the business owner, especially for people who aren't ready to sell their company, if you just want to operate it or maybe grow it or maybe not. So unlike Oedipus and the Sphinx, stage three is not old and feeble. Stage three of these companies is actually the largest and the strongest, but it's also the rarest. This is where most people get tripped up, moving mm -hmm. from stage one to stage two, where from being hands-on to being hands-off. And the change is so vast, it's so extraordinary that I call it taking your company through puberty. It's like the difference between a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old. <laughs> sure, they're bigger, but there's a lot. Everything else is different as well. Their physical <laughs> abilities, their mental abilities, their emotional situation, their goals, their desires, everything is different. Before I get into all these differences between stage one and stage two, let me tell you about the two big ones. Remember these three things? A stage one company actually feels like this because you're personally doing the making and the selling. Even when you have employees, they are mostly involved in helping you do what you do best. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing to notice is that both of these activities are customer focused. You're dealing directly with customers when you're making or selling. But a stage two company can feel like this. So the first big change is where you're spending your time and your focus. You'll be moving away from focusing on customers. You've hired other people to do that and eventually to be actually responsible for the making and the selling. And you're spending your time building the company, working with employees, hiring, training, managing, planning. That's the first big change. And, it, and it's really a shock to a lot of people. The second big change is this. You need working capital. And as your company grows, you need more of it. It can feel like your cash is just going down the drain. And if you don't have enough working capital, you can run out of cash and be out of business even when you're profitable. Mm -hmm. The simplest explanation of why you need working capital is it takes money to make something or hire people before you can sell it and get the cash from the sale. There's a gap in time between when you have to lay out the money and when you have the money come in. The bigger your company, the more you make and sell, the bigger that gap is. And so the more cash you need. And that's a shock to many people as well. These are Now we're gonna get into the other, all the other checklists of all the other uh, distinctions between these stages. So we've already talked a little bit about the focus. In stage one, you're focused on making and selling the product. In stage two, your focus is building the company. In stage three, your company is really becoming a national, regional, or, or maybe even an industry powerhouse. 
you're building your company into a brand. And you often do this by taking over other companies, buying out competitors, making partnerships or joint ventures. So it's really a much more expansive kind of organization. Your time in stage one is mostly spent with customers, as I said. In stage two, your time is mostly spent with employees. And then you start to hire managers and you spend your time with the managers and they spend their time with employees. Mm -hmm. Stage three, your time is mostly with industry leaders or joint venture partners or doing due diligence on some companies that you're trying to acquire. So it's a very different place where you spend your time as your company grows through these stages. Your people, and by that I mean your employees, in a stage one company, they're directed by you, the owner. In stage two, you're moving from depending on good people who just have these great intuitions to actually putting processes in place. And so you're hiring managers and your people are uh, working within those processes that you, processes that you have defined. This makes it actually easier to hire good people because you're not depending on them to have lots of experience. You're bringing that to the table for them. And in stage three, you've started to hire people who have director responsibilities. And some of those have profit and loss responsibilities for different aspects of the company. So it's a whole different kind of, of organization. Um, someone once explained this as, at first you hire people to do the work, then you hire managers to tell people to do the work, and then you hire directors who tell you what needs to be done because they know more than you about their specific area. So that changes a lot through the three stages. The energy of a company is completely different as it grows. Stage one company can be a roller coaster. It's a huge adrenaline rush. You, when you get a new sale, you get a new project, you get some a new completion of a deal. Uh, it's great. And then if things go south for a little while, it can be almost despair. You, you're not going to make payroll. You don't know how things are going to make it through the next month. It can be very up and down. Stage two is more steady. There's still a lot of highs and lows, a very exciting time, some, some tough times, but it usually doesn't put the company at risk the way it can in stage one. And then stage three can feel like almost separate companies because different things are happening in different parts of the company at the same time. So the energy is very different. Let's look at, talk about finance. Finances and accounting, uh, stage one companies basically use checkbook accounting. It's cash flow mostly. It's money comes in, money comes out. If we have money left over at the end of the month, oh great, honey, we can go out to dinner. You know, <laughs> it's not more, much more sophisticated than that. Um, stage two uses pretty standard accounting. And as they get uh, more mature in stage two, they use reports not just for taxes and who owes them money, but they use these reports for management decisions, things like pricing and things like, um, you know, they know their gross margin of different product lines and should we open up a new product line or, or make those kinds of decisions. And they use financial reports for that. And then in stage three is very sophisticated finance. They have debt and equity and they're buying and selling organizations. So there's a whole a lot of complications that go at that level. Planning in stage one is pretty non-existent. You're basically trying to get through the next month or trying to get through this project or whatever. Um, stage two, you put annual uh, plans in place. And often those are missing at the beginning of stage two, but as a stage two company matures, they need those plans. Not only do they need them, but they know how to use them. They know how to make them uh, hold people accountable throughout the year. And often those plans are broken down into quarterly plans as well. Stage three companies plan out a lot farther. Uh, in a stage two company, if you try to plan out five years, often the plan's not useful because the world will change so much in those five years. But stage three companies have long-term projects that go on and so they need to plan a lot further out. Um, there's even a company that I knew about in Connecticut, uh, Pratt & Whitney, they make engines for jet airplanes. And when they have a new engine, they have to do a 50 year business plan for that engine because that's how long they're going to need to produce parts and do maintenance and things like that. Uh, it's not 50 years for the entire company, but it is for that, that particular part. So the planning changes as you go through these stages. Let's talk about time away from the business. Uh, it's not possible to get time away in stage one. You, you basically own a job uh, and not a company as Michael Gerber said. Um, 
if you do take time away in stage one, if you're doing it well, business just stops or slows down and then you come back and you pick it back up. If you're not doing it well, you get away and business crashes and then you've got a big mess to come back to. Uh, stage two, it's fine to get away. You've got, like I said, you've got systems, you've got processes, you've got people and you can get away for personal reasons. You can get away for business reasons. Um, sometimes you have other endeavors that you're running, other businesses you're running, or maybe you're involved in philanthropy or some other things, and it's fine to get away. Stage three, it's often required that you travel for business reasons because you have a, a regional or a national scope. So you're often out of the office. Stage one companies don't have many advisors. Uh, they often have a CPA, but they only use them for taxes typically. And they may have a payroll company if they have payroll. But other than that, stage one companies feel like to spend money on an advisor is a waste of money. They feel like it's a cost. By the time you've grown to stage two, you realize it's not a cost, it's an investment. And you get people to advise you when you need it. So you often have a coach. You may have uh, more than one lawyer because lawyers specialize. So you may have an employment lawyer and a transactional lawyer. Um, you do have a CPA that you depend on for advice, not just for doing your taxes. You may have, uh, they may actually be like your CFO or you may have a CFO that you bring in part-time. Uh, you may have an advisory board. Stage two companies often have good relationships with bankers or insurance agents or other people that they use that are outside their organization. And of course, stage three, they use many advisors frequently. They have industry specific people that they depend on because they know what they don't know and they need to bring that knowledge in-house. Sales happen in stage one only when you're focused on it. And one of the downfalls of a company like this is that you can get so caught up in a project in the making side of things that you drop the ball on marketing or sales for a while. Then when the project ends, you have to go pick it up and it takes a while to get uh, the sales ramped up again. Stage two sales is a separate process and it's more constant. So that's not so much of an issue. And stage three companies tend to look at sales in a strategic way. There's markets that they want to open or that they want to get more, more market share in, or that there's certain products that they want to go after or certain ways that they want to do better than um, competitors. So they look at sales as more part of their strategic plan for the company. In stage one companies, you can make a good living. Typically, uh, sometimes you make less. And often that's because the owners or the CEO has this attitude that their time is free and that they don't charge appropriately. They don't price things appropriately and they don't, they don't run it as efficiently as they could. Stage two companies can be quite lucrative. The owner can make into the millions. Often at this stage, they tend to take the money out in terms of in a salary or distributions. And so in stage three companies, they're so profitable, they can take money out to have a, a good, maybe even a better than good lifestyle and still keep most of the profit in the company because like I said, they're expanding, they're buying other uh, organizations, et cetera, and they need the cash to do that. There is a, a distinction sometimes in stage one companies that are run by uh, a superstar. So you see this with musicians or athletes or a superstar lawyer, uh, a neurosurgeon, somebody who makes a lot of money, but I still consider it a stage one company because it's based on that person. And one of the things that trips them up sometimes is when they have a huge amount of money, they need much more sophisticated financial checks and balances. And they often don't put them in because it's still operating like a stage one organization. This is sometimes where you'll see, uh, and you'll hear about this as a famous person who might get ripped off by, uh, by somebody, an advisor that's untrustworthy, or they might get in trouble with the IRS because even though they have stage two or even stage three type income and they need the financial checks and balances at that level, they don't put them in place. Stage one companies, uh, there is no wealth in the company. You can be wealthy as a, running a stage one company if you make enough money and live below your means, invest the rest in stocks or real estate or something like that. But when it comes to selling the company, it's, it's basically sold for parts. Your customer list might be worth something, your inventory, your equipment, but um, there's not much value as a going concern because when you're gone, it's not going. Mm -hmm. uh, 
stage two companies, there is more wealth in the company and you can easily uh, transition out. It doesn't affect the operation for them to get a new owner. And stage three companies can have intergenerational wealth uh, within the company and that can go on for, for a long time. So this brings up the, the idea that I said before about maybe having a stage one company with a lot of money and you need stage two or stage three infrastructure to do the financial checks and balances brings up this idea that your company can actually be in different stages for different parts of the character of the characteristics. So as we were going through this list, you may have thought, well, I'm kind of in stage one at this and I'm moving to stage two at that. There's no hard and fast movement from here's stage one, here's stage two. Like, you know, when you graduate from school or you get your driver's license, uh, one day you're one place, next day you're totally different. That's not how it grows with companies. But uh, so I put together these stages in a checklist for you as a handout if you want it. I, I go through this list and I also give you some other insights that we didn't have time to cover here. So you can see where your company's at and what's going to happen if you grow it in certain ways. So I know I haven't answered this question. Should you grow your company? <laughs> and that's because I don't know what you want. When I start with a client, I have an exercise called 20 questions, which is let's pretend your company was a genie and gave you unlimited wishes. None of these, like you get three wishes and the third one has to be, I wish for more wishes. You know, you get as many as you want, but what do you want from your company? Almost everybody wants money, obviously. But then there's a whole lot of other things that you could want. Some people want their companies to leave a legacy. Some people don't care about that. Mm -hmm. Some people want their companies to help them travel. Some people don't care about that. There's a lot of other things. And so we start with, what do you want? It's only when you know what you want that you can decide if you should grow and if you should, how fast. And de depending on those decisions, you can develop your company to maximize the profit and make sure it gives you what you want. I have clients who don't want to grow into a stage two company, for example. They don't want to stop working with directly with their customers. Well, that's fine. There's ways to improve a stage one company. Growth is not the only option to getting what you want. So even though I haven't answered this question, I hope I've given you a framework to think about it and to answer it for yourself. So if you would like a copy of this deck, uh, you can email me. This will be recorded as Marina said. If you would like a copy of the handout, shoot me an email, john at ceobootcamp.com. Just let me know what session you want the handout for because I do so many of these. And if I can help you grow your company or make it more profitable without growth, email me for that as well. So thank you and uh, we'll take questions. John, this is absolutely amazing. And um, I know we, you and I talk about this all the time. And um, I talk about this all the time with my clients because this seems to be sort of a, always an issue, but it is that move from stage one to stage two, where you do go through the teenage stages of, you know, here you were, and then just in a short period of time, there's so many changes. It's really hard to get a handle on, on it. And it really is taking your hands off of the work, the actual right. making and uh, selling, and how to utilize uh, your staff from support function to actually doing the work and transitioning that. And I think what I kind of wanted to, to talk about is that the concept of the comfort zone. You know, we read a lot about the whole thing of, you know, you only grow when you get out of your comfort zone and, and, you know, big things happen. You just need to get out of the comfort zone. And I think this is really where a lot of people get stuck is that you, let's say you left your employer because you wanted to do things better. And now you open up your business and you've essentially replaced your job. You want to do better. You want to provide that better customer service, or you want to make that better product. And you only know how to do it because this is what your training is, and this is what you've learned in school, and this is what your experience is, and that's where you're comfortable is making the product and selling it to your client. And I think that that whole concept of that now you're going to take your hands off of the making of the product is really what trips up a lot of people. And yeah. I don't know if you see that kind of working with your small business clients. I do. And the analogy that I use for that is, 
when you're doing it yourself, you can do it very intuitively. Mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneurs have a, a reputation of being control freaks. I, I think that's only part of the problem. Um, it's that we're intuitive and not process oriented. So mm -hmm. it's like a chef that makes really good food, but doesn't have a recipe. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to expand, if you're going to take your hands off, you need to take to develop a recipe. Mm -hmm. You need to take that stuff that's in your head and put it into processes and procedures. When you do that, it's amazing because now you're not just able to hire people who have good intuition. You can hire people and you can train them how to do it the way you did it because now it's a process. And that's really the hard part. Once you've got it into a process, then it becomes easier to scale up. Well, and I think the other hard part about it is that you you have to be okay with that loss of sort of in control and maybe that your recipe is not perfect. So in reading a lot of those books, even before you and I were working together, is that when the companies scale, remember there was a book, I think um, I, I was reading, you know, before we got into the coaching where it's like, this lady opened a business and then she scaled and she had multiple locations and then she got all freaked out and like closed everything because her customers were not happy and the, you know, stuff was falling off the shelves and the product being sold was all, all stale inventory. And she was like, no, 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 forget it. She closed up shop and went back to just being by herself and says, okay, I'm scaling back down. And so at which point do you know, I guess, that I am doing it right. I'm doing it wrong. This is just part of the growing pain. It is going to happen. Like, well, it's, if it's, so if her customers weren't happy, that's the clue. Mm -hmm. And that tells me one of two things. Either the recipe wasn't done right or she wasn't holding people accountable to actually follow the recipe. She mm -hmm. was being too not nice mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. And as a result, those people lost their job. So she really wasn't being nice. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. At you know. the end of the day, she didn't do anybody any favors. Right. 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 So, and it's really all about um, the purpose of a company is to per, to make a customer. And if you're not making them happy, then you have to do your uh, your recipe better. Or, like I said, you have to hold people accountable to that. Mm -hmm. And if you decide you don't like to do that and you want to go back, that's a different reason. And, you know, you just enjoy this better. Great. Then I'm not going to have this big company. I'm going to do these other things. That's a, that's a good reason to decide not to grow. But the fact that you can't do it just means you aren't, you aren't skilled in that area. Mm -hmm. And so get people to help you put the processes in place, learn how to hold other people accountable. Um, you know, management is not a, a social interaction. It's a different kind of, of work, even though there's people involved and we don't want to be jerks. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like just being pals with people mm -hmm. and it's a different mindset. You know, what really helped me when you and I talked about this uh, sometime last year was the whole concept of, you know, when, when you've got people working with you and, you know, it's a small organization and we say family. And then you said, no, you have to think of it as a team, not a family, yeah. because you, know, you can't get rid of family and then, and then you may, may fight. And uh, you but the team is a different thing where everybody's got a role and they've got to do they've got to be good at the role that they're have in the team for the whole team to function well, like in a sports team or, or, you know, it's, but then know that if you are going to screw up, you are, there's a next the quarterback coming. <laughs> Who's better? Well, and the, the, the purpose of a team is different than the purpose of a family. You know, a family, we want to build a unit where we're safe, where there's unconditional love, where no matter what happens, we're going to be there. And, you know, people are going to take care of us and we're going to take care of them. That's not the purpose of a business. The purpose of a business, like I said, is to create a customer. It's the customers that allow the business to survive. And if you're not keeping them happy now beyond that, that's where the vision of your particular business comes in. You can have a, a vision of making this huge organization, lots of customers that you keep happy, or you can keep it kind of small and just say, I'm going to work this and, and do it this way. Uh, but whatever you do for your vision, the rest of it has to fit within that. And that's the goal, you know, unlike uh, teams, pretty much their only goal is to win. 
you know, so, uh, I mean, if you're in football, you've got to be going for the Super Bowl or you're not on the team anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, it's a little bit different with business, but it's still around the customer that Mm -hmm. allows the company to survive. The vision is also tough. And I think for a small business owner who's also trying to scale and trying to move the company from stage one to stage two, even having the vision is something that they have to practice at. So you can have entrepreneur who's um, very, um, just, it's natural, you know, they're born that they're, they don't know how they're going to do it, but they know that in five years, they're going to have a company that grosses $10 million in sales, right? Like that's, or, you know, we're yeah. going to have this, this is going to be our client, or this is how much income I'm going to have in my pocket. I think most people are not like that. I think most people kind of have this like wishful thinking. And we talked a little bit about that. Like, what's your plan? What's your gorilla plan? What's your, you know, moonshot? And, and roof shot, but it's almost like you're afraid to have a big vision. You're afraid to allow yourself to say, wow, in five years, I'm going to have a company that grosses 10 million. Is that even possible? Like, how do I get there? So I think that's the other thing yeah. that a lot of the small business owners, although they do have the vision, they also have to allow themselves to you know, think big, like, go, go and get it. Like you can, yes. And, and what is it that you really want? Don't be afraid to really think about what you want. I think that's the other thing is that you're just happy because now you're out of your miserable job and doing the same thing just for yourself. But I think you got to allow yourself to, to see that vision a little bit more. Right. Yeah. And that, that's why I start with the 20 questions exercise, because it helps people actually clarify what their vision is. What do they want from their company? You know, a a simple example is travel. If you want to travel because of your business, then you will grow in lots of different places and you'll look for a kind of business where you can have clients, um, you know, in other areas. I wouldn't open a 24 hour delicatessen if that's your goal. (laughs) Yes. Don't open a restaurant if you want to travel. Yes. (laughs) You know, uh, well, if you want to, travel in the restaurant business, then you open multiple restaurants, you open a chain of restaurants and you look and and that builds your business in a very different way. Mm -hmm. Um, I was talking to two women who were partners and one of them said, I want to be famous. Mm -hmm. And the other one said, I really don't, Mm -hmm. you know, well, Mm -hmm. if you want to be famous, if you want to be known as a thought leader in your industry or in your region, then you build your business in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you do it in another way. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times those ideas and that vision is subconscious Mm -hmm. and it actually affects your, uh, your business decisions, but until you put it on the table, you don't know how. Mm -hmm. So you might hesitate about a certain thing because, well, you know, that means I'm not going to be able to have time with my family and that's what I really want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's put that on the table and say, let's build a company that does allow you time with your family. Um, other people don't want that. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I actually just heard it. There's a podcast called How I Built This, where they talk to people who have built very large companies. And there's a guy named uh, Rick Steves, who has a travel company. He started with travel guides of going to Europe. And now he takes people on tours, at least before the pandemic, and he will afterwards. He's got a lot of uh, TV shows on mostly on public television. And what's interesting to him was for me to hear this, he talked about how much strain it put on his family Mm -hmm. when his kids were young. He was totally unapologetic about that. Mm -hmm. He just said, that's the way it is. Um, Mm -hmm. And now my kids are in their thirties. We have wonderful relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, I missed a lot of their growing up, but that's what it took to build this business. Mm -hmm. He, he was, that's his decision. He made it consciously. And there you go. Um, yeah. Well, and I also have to say, when you were talking about getting help, you know, getting, you know, you're doing kind of everything yourself in stage one, and you don't even think that you need to pay for having a CPA or having, you know, uh, right. I, I do need a CPA, if you know, a good one. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's true about getting help. And, you know, I talked to the benefit of, of kind of us being it, where we are is that I have a lot of retired executives or retired business owners. And when they come for their tax meeting, I pick their brain a lot. And I say, well, how did you get from in your company? Like, what did you do in your 40s? And how did you get 
there when you were working 24 seven and like, what was your path? Because, you know, everybody's got a bit of a different story and I just kind of picked their brain. And I have this one client and, and I talked to him a lot about the, our coaching and that we're involved in. And, and he said to me, you know, he said, you guys are, you know, you and Joanne, you're so, you're, you're bright and you guys do a lot of business work with other businesses. You, you would have gotten here anyway. Like you would have gotten into the growth and gotten into these concepts. Then I said, Possibly, yes, but I think when you get help, you can get there faster and you can really tap into the resources of people who have been doing this for a long time. And so maybe I would have had this realization of who's my perfect client five years from now, except I got there in within six months of, you know, starting to work with, with right. a coach. And it goes for all types, like same thing if you hire a manager, if you hire a CFO, if you hire a CPA, if you hire an attorney uh, to watch a business, I think it works in the same way is that when you finally realize you need help, you may not quite know how that help or what exactly that help is gonna look like, but that is really gonna propel you to move into that, um, uh, to go from that stage one to stage two faster. Yeah. And if you get that advice, you can do it without, you can be prepared for the pitfalls that are coming. Mm -hmm. So like, as you, as you know, mm -hmm. as a company gets into stage two, their cost structure changes mm -hmm. because they have more in-house people, their overhead might be higher. Well, that's going to change what their pricing should be. That's going to change who their market is. Uh, one of the big ones that happens usually around 50 employees you have to bring on a full-time HR person. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you're spending, you know, 50, 60, $70,000 on an employee that is not bringing in any, mm -hmm. any revenue. Mm -hmm. They're not making your place more efficient. In fact, they may be doing the opposite to mm -hmm. keep you in compliance. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yes. you know, but yeah. if you don't do that, then things come to a screeching halt. And if you know that that's going to happen, maybe two or three years before it does, now you can plan for it. And now you can say, what's this going to look like when I have that, that person on staff? What's my overhead? What's my working capital needs? You can plan for that stuff. And companies that don't plan, some of them don't make it. Uh, particularly the working capital thing is a, you know, it can put a company out of business if you're not prepared. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, this, this is all amazing. These are all great concepts. And I, I love kind of talking about it and reading about it. So it's, um, I'll, I'm sure I'll get a lot more into getting back to growing my own business once I'm a little bit more out of the the, the hands on head down the next couple of right. weeks to get through the deadline. It feels like everybody's got their hands, hands on and head down at the moment. Um, but yeah. thank you. Well, you know, so I think when I think of you guys in tax season, I think of uh, UPS, the, you know, the Brown trucks that are always on the road. Well, their big season is Christmas. Mm -hmm. That's when all the packages go and they have a policy that everybody from the president on mm -hmm. down, is in a truck or in a warehouse during Christmas season. They just mm -hmm. know that's that's the nature of it, the beast. It, it really does. It really does take, at this time, it really does take everybody. I think the idea though, is that when it is not so crazy, is that you as the business owner are doing the right thing to keep propelling the company forward. And not, you know, because it's easy to be like, okay, well, I've got another tax return to do. And then I've got another phone call to make. And then you really don't make time for, for dealing with the growth and the stages and hiring and and all of and the systems and stuff like that, so I um, thankfully thanks to you, John, it's on my calendar for Thursdays. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. This is awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining. This is uh, amazing as always. We will be back next Tuesday. Um, actually, the email just went out to. Um, all our peeps about a lineup for May webinars, and we got some interesting topics. We will be back next Tuesday with um, whether you should buy a franchise or not. <laughs> so I'm sure that'll be that'll be quite interesting for a lot of folks. But um, uh, like I said, this recording is available. It'll be posted within about a day or two on uh, coonsassociates.com and coonsparkin.com. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see everybody next Tuesday. And thank you, John. My pleasure. Take care.